this is part of a, a larger presentation I do called the Business of Medicine. It's a lecture I've been doing for 22 years now. I started doing it for uh, the American College, which is the internal medicine trade group. And I had a lot of 50 year olds that said, gosh, I wish I would have heard this information when I was 32 because I made so many mistakes coming out of training. And student loans were one of the number one issues more important today than they were 20 years ago because the rates are higher, college is more expensive, and so people have a lot more in the student loan. So what I'm doing is I'm taking my presentation and expanding the student loan portion of it um, as you know, cutting out the contract and some of the other financial planning side, the retirement planning side, just to focus on the student loan side here. So, um, so let's just talk just a little bit about my group. I'm an independent financial planner, just like you guys don't work for a pharmaceutical company. Um, I just uh, completely independent of any investment company, certified financial planner, uh, and this is my team here. So this is what we want to avoid. It's, it's incredible how many seniors are still paying their student loans. And we want to uh, address that because I think it's probably the most important financial issue that a working physician can address. Um, you know, eventually you get to retirement planning, but here, here's why it's such an issue. Um, and for the DO graduates, more going to private uh, medical school, it is it is more expensive. Um, so these are the numbers for the average physician graduating, and I would bet that most of you um, are more than this. So it's it, the numbers are big, make and it makes the decisions more impactful for your life. So the, there's about 25% of you that are lucky enough to not have student loans, but um, for the other 75%, this is this will be very relevant information. Um, and so most of you are either going to have some private loans, those are just some maybe additional money that you received or needed to get on top of what the limits of the federal loans were, but most of you are going to have federal loans. They're going to be one of these types of loans. Um, most of them are going to be direct subsidized or unsubsidized loans. You might have had gotten some plus loans um, in graduate school. Um, for those of you who graduated a while ago, maybe you have some FELL loans, um, but most of you are going to have the direct loans, either non-consolidated or consolidated. So these are going to be what we're really talking about and what to do with these loans and strategies based on where your career path is going to be. Most people, if you've graduated in the last few years, you are going to be on an income-driven repayment plan. So there's four different types of income-driven repayment income-based repayment, and it's a little confusing, IBR, IBR, um, and then there's income contingent repayment plan, but really want to focus on the payee, the pay as you earn plan, and then the repayee, which is going to be the majority of um, borrowers should be on the repayee plan. The only time we would ever want you to be on the payee plan is if you have a higher earning spouse, you have lots of student loans, you're going for public service loan forgiveness. Um, there is the option to do married filing separately. And the payee plan, the unique feature of this plan is that the spouse's income does not count towards the payment. And so if you're going for eventual public service for forgiveness, you want the lowest possible payment over the term. So that's where the payee plan, if you've got a spouse that's maybe in another career or a few years ahead of you in training and you know already out in practice making your know, real physician income. Uh, but most of you are gonna be on the repay plan. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the repay plan and really focus our time there. So it stands for the Revised Pays You Earn program. It's been out for six years now from 2015 and it expanded the available pool of people that could take advantage of this. So anyone that's on a direct loan, or if you did have some of these other loans like FELL loans, you could consolidate them to a direct loan and take advantage of the repay program. So what does your payment gonna be? It is going to be 10% of your disposable income. How do you calculate disposable income? The disposable income is gonna be your adjusted gross income minus 150% of the poverty level. And there's a, a number that the Department of Education has based on your household size, that's the poverty level. So, so you take your adjusted gross income, take out the poverty level, depending on how many people are in your household, and then you take 10% of that. 
that is your annual payment. So you divide it by 12. And so, um, so that's, that's the calculation for figuring out what you repay. Those of you who are new into um, you know, practice, your payment could be as little as zero, because if you were just coming out of medical school, um, you might have a zero payment your first year. And we'll talk about that and why forbearance almost never is a good idea in a few slides here. So the repay program, a couple points. This one does include, no matter what, both spouses' income in calculating the payment. So it's not great if you have a higher earning spouse, but it actually could be beneficial if you have a spouse uh, that is a stay-at-home spouse or, or doesn't make a whole lot of money. Um, the key reason that most of you are going to be on this plan is there's an interest subsidy through the federal government for those people in lower income. And in, in, in our world today, that's going to basically mean those in residency or fellowship. Okay. And then the repay plan does qualify for public service loan forgiveness. So it is one of the eligible plans that you can be on to take advantage of the public service loan forgiveness which is a big topic. Uh, so we'll talk about the PSLF in a few minutes here. Okay, so the repay plan is the only plan with a subsidy. And so the way that works is if your payment does not, the interest that accrues does not pay for, um, if, if the amount of your payment does not equal the interest that's accruing, so your loan's actually getting bigger or negative really amortizing, the government subsidizes for the first three years all of that extra interest, and then for the rest of the time, 50% of that interest. So that's really nice if they're going to pay you know, half of your, your extra interest, and that doesn't capitalize on your loan. So look at the bottom slide. Um, so if you've got an interest charge of $2,000 a month, uh, but your payment based on the calculations only $1,250, the government's going to pay um, $300. Uh, $750 of that, and then you'll pay the other $375. So, you know, it, it, it's not insignificant. And so we definitely want to take advantage of that if you are eligible for that. Okay. Especially those first, definitely during residency, fellowship, and maybe your first year out of training. Okay. That is the repay subsidy. You own with a subsidy. Now, no matter which repayment plan you're on, you actually can write off the interest for student loans, but there's a key, there's always, with all these rules, there's always a but, a caveat. Um, and this is that once you're out of training, making real physician income, you probably can't deduct it because there's a cap on what you can deduct. So for a single person, once you hit $85,000, you can't deduct any of the interest. Once you're married and hit 170, you can't deduct it. There's a phase out just below that where you can deduct a portion of the $2,500 in interest. If your interest is 30,000 a year, you can only deduct 2,500. So it's not a huge deduction, but for those people who are in fellowship um, and residency, it's definitely worth you know, a couple hundred dollars to you and they want, you know, definitely wanna take advantage of that. Um, you can't be in deferment. It doesn't count if you're, you're in deferment or forbearance. You actually have to be paying the loan. You actually have to be writing a check to the loan servicer. Okay, so that is the student loan interest deduction. You'll know, you just give your 1099E, which comes every year to your tax preparer. Now, public service loan forgiveness. This has just been a, a really hot topic and it is a program that's flawed for sure. Um, a lot of people don't understand it. So that's partially the Department of Education's fault. It's also partially the fault of the servicers who are terrible historically at calculating payments. And I mean, just counting to 120, not all of them can do that. So what do you have to do to qualify for PSLF? One, you have to be working at a qualifying employer. So a nonprofit, government organization, a 501c3. So a lot of the residency programs will qualify for that. So that's great if you're, you're getting a minimum of three years already under your belt, plus any sort of fellowship or training. You know, that can get you by the end of a you know, fellowship, you know, maybe halfway towards forgiveness. Um, so you have to make 120 payments, okay, towards a direct loan. 
and you have to be on an income driven repayment plan. So we talked about the repay plan or the pay plan. Those are going to be the two income driven repayment plans that most people are going to want to do. If you're curious how many, if you're on this path and you're curious how many months you have, the Department of Ed has a file called the National Student Loan Database file that will tell you how many months they show is credited towards your, your eventual 120. Now, what do you do between now and that 120 month time period at the end? The key thing is every year you should be doing your employment certification form. It's just a one pager you give to your HR department. They sign off with your start date, end date, and that certifies the amount. It, they send that to Department of Education and it certifies that you are working for that year in a qualifying institution. So the Department of Education adds that towards your count of eligible months, okay? You should do that anytime or every year, anytime you start or change jobs, um, or if you haven't done it yet, you need to go back and do it from your start of public service jobs, okay? So a couple other key points on public service loan forgiveness is there is no limit to the amount forgiven and it is tax free. If you're on one of the other income driven repayment plans and just plan to pay those for 20 years, at the end of that term, you get a 1099 for the interest and actually have to pay tax on whatever is forgiven. Typically when debt is forgiven in the tax code, you have to pay tax on that. Well, this is an exception on the public service loan forgiveness. You could have $200,000 of debt forgiven tax free. And that's why the more your loan balance is and the less your earning potential is, the more attractive the PSLF program is. Um, generally better for primary care, there's more jobs that um, are gonna be eligible and you're probably not taking quite as much of a hit working at an academic or a nonprofit compared to a successful private practice in one of the higher paying subspecialties, whether that be neurosurgery, spine, OB, yeah, orthopedic specifically. Um, now, if any of you are in that vintage where you're close to being eligible to have your loans forgiven, one key thing is you still have to be working at that job to apply to, to get your loans forgiven. So you can't work 120 months, go work for Kaiser Permanente, and then go submit your public service loan forgiveness because it will be rejected because you have to be at the job when you apply for forgiveness, okay? And this is, you know, they've talked about doing away with this, but it is, it's made it through a couple administrations of different parties. Um, and so this is a completely new thing. And the payments, so it's 120 payments which assuming you don't have a break in work, it's 10 years, okay? But if they do not have to be consecutive. So you could take a year off, you know, you could have you know, some maternity or paternity leave. Um, they do not have to be consecutive payments. They just have to be 120 total payments, okay? And their monthly payments is you know, 120 months, okay? You also do not wanna pay more than the scheduled amount because that throws it into something called payhead status and it confuses the loan servicer. Um, and so they're basically like, if, you're, if your payment's $1,200 and you pay $1,300, they'll count, your, count that $100 extra towards your next payment, but won't count that as a full payment. It screws them up. So you just wanna pay your scheduled payment. Okay. Now, there's been a lot of talk about public service loans applications being declined. And that number is completely true. It's been going down. I mean, the program's only been, you know, in a position to forgive loans for three years because it started in 2007. So 10 years from then, you know, 2017, you know, and not everyone was ready to go at the beginning. So it's only been, there's only been recent applications. And a lot of them, are, most of them are actually declined. Granted, this is for all occupations, not physicians who have a much more regimented career track than someone who goes to work for the Peace Corps, then volunteers, works for a community organization. You know, you guys have a very steady, you know, more 
clearly defined role um, and also the institutions are more clearly nonprofits if you're working at a university. So um, they're getting better, but the reasons people got declined, 59% for not having enough uh, payments, so they didn't count to 120. A quarter of them didn't fill out the forms right. 11% tried to have their private loans forgiven, um, their fell loans, um, or they weren't at the right job. But most people just hadn't got enough payments or it, the servicer hadn't recorded it correctly, or they just didn't fill out the form right. But those people that got it forgiven, $76,000 of tax-free forgiveness, that's really important, okay? So, and most of you are gonna be significantly higher than that. Um, if you just went to like, if you said, hey, I'm graduating from medical school and I just make the repay payments for the next 10 years, you'll probably, essentially just pay the interest portion the entire 10 years and the amount forgiven will be pretty close to what you started with, okay? So you don't really take a, you don't put a dent in it, um, but if it's forgiven. So I realize not everyone's gonna go for public service. So you're either gonna go the PSLF route, you're gonna do your, you're gonna just follow the rules to a T, do your employment certification form, that's the first thing keep track of every conversation with your loan servicer, take notes who you talk to. And then at the end of that 120 months, you apply for forgiveness. Or you're gonna go the private route. You're gonna start a private practice, join Optum, you know, work for Kaiser, whatever the non-public service route is gonna be. And it definitely makes sense at current rates. You know, I'll talk to most people are, you know, graduating today are about 6.8% on their, their student loans you can definitely do better than that. Once you go down the refinance route, you can no, no longer go back to PSLF. So you have to be pretty you know, committed to that route, but you're gonna contact a private lender. Sure, there's no interest through um, September of this year. So interest starts again in October, but I can pretty much assure you that in September, the phones are gonna be ringing off the hook at the banks to consolidate or to refinance these loans. So you might wanna, get ahead of it. And also there's some companies that are doing some no interest period. So you're not paying interest um, you know, while the government's deferring interest too. So you're gonna refinance these loans. Typically they're in a shorter time period. So instead of doing a 20 year repayment term, you might be on a five, a seven or a 10 year repayment, but your interest is gonna be cut in half, okay? That is gonna probably still increase your payment though, because you're going from 20 years to repay it compared to, to seven years or five years. So your payment might go up, but your interest rate's gonna be cut in half. And then you can always make additional payments. Basically, you wanna make your payment, you wanna be able to fit your payment into your budget. So you can do a 10 year repayment plan and then make it a five year if you wanna pay extra, okay? But that, because usually there's no prepayment penalties on the private refinances. And you know, there's lots of good resources. Uh, Credible, SoFi, First Republic, those are kind of the main ones. Um, Laurel Road, those are some of the main ones that are doing private refinances for physicians. So I wanna to talk to anyone that's in medical school or just get out of medical school right now. You do not wanna do uh, a loan forbearance if you are going to be um, just entering residency. The reason for that is the payments on the on all the income driven repayment plans are they're income driven. So what's your income been in medical school? Probably not a lot. So your payment's going to be pretty close to zero your first year of residency. So my recommendation was don't do forbearance coming out of medical school, but apply to be on one of the re, on the repay plan. That way you'll get your first hundred or your first ten. Sorry first 12 payments um, at essentially a zero payment or pretty close to it um, because your past income is so low. And then, um, you know, you'll basically get credit for a full year of payments without making, really needing to make a payment. Um, most pe people, you know, if you're not going to go that route, you know, forbearance of use can't afford to make your payments. But even if you're going to the refinance route, you can still um, do the repay plan, even if you're not doing public service loan forgiveness, okay? Um, 
Yeah, so loan forbearance, not generally a good idea, okay? Um, it's better than defaulting on loans because it does not impact your credit score, um, but it's not a great long-term solution. All right, and so my, my kind of strategy for those coming out of training is have a plan, have a written plan for how you're gonna get out of your student loan debt. And that will coordinate with other debts such as purchasing a home. Um, generally, the, the idea is if you are very interested in, in buying a home fairly quickly, you're gonna wanna keep your loans as is um, and then refinance your loans after you get into a house. The reason for that is because if you're on the edge of qualifying for a mortgage, you know, when you do this private refinance, your payment's gonna go up. Your, the payment that's listed as your minimum payment on your credit score is gonna be significantly higher than your 25 year repayment plan on the payee plan or the repay. So usually the plan is live like a resident for a year, save up enough for a down payment, purchase the house, which is a great tax deduction and you know, definitely some benefits to owning a home, and then refinance your student loans and get those done as soon as possible. One question we get a lot is, do I pay my mortgage off first or do I pay my student loans off first? So currently mortgage rates and student loan refinances are pretty close to the same interest rate, about 3% give or take, but mortgage interest is deductible no matter what your income is, whereas student loan interest is only deductible if you're under those income caps we talked about before. So my recommendation would be to pay, if you wanna pay additional towards getting out of debt, pay extra towards your student loans, not towards the mortgage, okay? And then figuring that home loan purchase out is important. And then um, working to bump up your disability insurance to match your new, um, your new income, bumping up your retirement plans, because those people in training, probably the first year out, they're going to pay more in tax than they made their last year of their residency. And so you know, that plus buying a home are probably the two most important things for saving taxes. And then, um, yeah, and just keep doing that employment certification form if you're doing the, uh, if you're doing the, PSLF program. So those are my, my main points on how to manage student loans and the paths you can take, whether it be PSLF or private refinancing. So Carl, do we have any questions for me that haven't been asked? Uh, nope, no additional questions. There was one in the chat and you covered that in your okay. talks. Good. And so, you know, if anyone has questions, you can reach out to me. I have a couple things that I can offer. One is I have a, a spreadsheet that um, that will um, keep track of you know who you talk to, your payments, um, and so that's it because you really want to keep great records of that. Also, the National Student Loan Database file is in a text file, which is a very odd way for them to display that. But I have software that will take that and actually give you something that looks like this which is a analysis of which different repayment plan will be the most beneficial if you pay the scheduled payment. Um, so uh, that, that's actually very helpful and we, it takes into account your um, family size, expected income and growth of income over time. Okay. Now there are some question about employer incentives um, and student loan payments. Typically, there will be some stipend for student loan um, payments. Um, that's taxable, though, generally. And so it's essentially like a signing bonus. Um, they don't always tie it to student loans because not everyone has student loans. Um, but generally, that is taxable to you. So, you know, that is something to consider. Um, but some of the private practices as part of their signing bonuses are doing that. Um, I haven't seen any plans with Kaiser specifically where they're going to repay the loans. The ones with Kaiser that are more popular or that I see people taking advantage of are in Northern California Kaiser, where they give you home loan assistance. And then they also facilitate a loan with a credit union to buy into the partnership. So in Northern California, you have to buy into the partnership. Southern California, you're just um, elected partner after that third year, assuming you 
are you know offered that partnership, but there's no actual cost to that. And then there's there's a few other plans that are um, out there. California suspended it, but they're going to be reinstating it. We're working at certain lower income areas. There are some additional California or state specific based um, incentives for loan forgiveness that are tax free, just like the federal one. So the PSLF is a federal program, but there are some there is one state specific one for depending on your pa patient population, you obviously underserved areas. All right. Well, that is everything. I just want to thank everyone. Um, if you have questions, definitely reach out. Um, you know, we help with obviously the student loan consulting, the general financial planning, the goal setting, the um, uh, investment insurance side of things, as well as you know putting you in touch with malpractice or uh, healthcare lawyers. I don't do that because I'm not an attorney, but you know we've got great resources that do that. Okay. All right, Carl, I think that's everything that I've got for you.